Hello everyone and welcome to Introduction to the Organ for Pianists. This workshop is being put on by the Syracuse chapter of the American Guild of Organists. My name is Sandy Murphy. I'm going to be one of your presenters and my colleague Alex Messler is going to be the other presenter a little bit later in the workshop. I'm here at beautiful Park Central Presbyterian Church in downtown Syracuse, where I'm currently the interim organist. And I wanna thank the church for allowing us to use its facilities, and in particular to thank Bob Allen, the music director here, for recording this broadcast. What we're gonna to do today is we're going to kind of go soup to nuts about how to begin playing the organ and this is assuming that you already have some keyboard skills as a pianist or an, another keyboard player. Um, we're gonna do this with an eye towards allowing you or enabling you to become a substitute organist for a worship service. And if that's something you're interested in, please know that there is a tremendous need for substitute organists in the general Syracuse area. I encourage you to reach out to your local churches and make it known that you're available to help out if they need a substitute. It's a great way to serve your community, make a difference, and also have a little bit of extra income on the side if you would like that. If that's not something you're interested in and you're interested in just learning how to play the organ, we're gonna cover that too. You can, all of the same principles that we're gonna talk about can be applied to that. So for today's agenda, we're going to start by talking about some service playing basics, what you can expect, and how you can gather the information that you're going to need in order to play a service. Once we talk about that, we're going to go on and talk about playing the instrument itself. And we're basically going to do a walkthrough from the beginning, starting with turning on the power and putting on your shoes and how to position yourself on the bench and walk through the console of the instrument and the various parts of the organ. We're gonna talk a little bit about some playing considerations, including particularly some fingering considerations that might be a little bit different from how you would normally play the piano. And once we're, talking, once we're done talking about that, we're gonna cut over to Alex, who's gonna give us some demonstrations on another organ of some of the things that we've been talking about. And then finally, we'll come back for a brief wrap-up discussion of some resources, and we're going to have a link below this video to a document that contains some of the resources that you might find helpful, both print resources and online resources. So let's get started. Service playing basics. Typically in a worship service, you're gonna have two kinds of playing that you're probably gonna need to do. You're gonna have some solo organ playing, and you're gonna have some accompaniment. The solo organ playing is likely to include a prelude, which is generally a softer, more meditative piece, and a postlude, which might be a little bit louder and a little bit more celebratory that comes at the very end of the service as folks begin to exit the church. Within the service, depending on your denomination and the particular service for that day, you may have additional playing. Um, some solo playing might include an offertory piece if there is to be an offering uh, communion piece if there is to be a communion. And you might also have um, a vocal soloist or an instrumental soloist that you might need to accompany. You might have a psalm, which might be a combination of accompanying a cantor and possibly a congregational response. And then you'll also certainly have some hymn playing. And each one of these types of playing is a little bit different as you already know from playing the piano. At the same general principles apply if you're going to be accompanying a soloist, you wanna make sure that the balance between the soloist and your instrument is good. If you're going to be leading a congregation in a hymn, you wanna make sure that your sound is robust enough to lead the congregation, but not so loud that it drowns them out. And you also want to adhere to the same general principles you would for any kind of congregational singing regardless of what instrument you're using to lead them, you're the leader, you set the tempo, and you lead them in the singing. Um, before, you begin, before you play a service, you're gonna wanna gather some information that's gonna help you out during the service. And probably the best way to do this is to talk to the resident musician at the church where you're going to be substituting and ask them 
for things like the following. You want to talk with them about how things usually go, the amount and the type of music that you're going to be needing, how the congregation sings, whether they sing robustly or whether they have a cantor that does most of the singing or whether they're soft singing, what the size of the congregation is, everything that might be a consideration in how you're going to play. And generally speaking, anyone who hires you to be a substitute is probably going to offer you this information as well. One thing you might want to ask for is a sample bulletin or order of service that will show you how things go. You want to be sure to ask whether or not there's any kind of communion that day, whether or not any other instrument, any other incidental music is going to be required. Ask about any traditions or any unwritten um, expectations or common practices that the resident organist does, for instance. Do they do opening chimes to start the service? Are there times of silence within the service? Is there any soft music, say, during a closing blessing or during communion preparations or wrapping up, that sort of a thing? If you have the opportunity to view a video of a past service or attend a service, that will also help you tremendously. Make sure that you ask to borrow a hymnal if you don't have the hymnal that that congregation uses in your personal collection. You may want to ask about the location of the organ version of a hymnal. Usually there's a ring binder version of a hymnal or any service music um, that is often kept um, on or near the organ or in the organ bench and that'll help you with having your music lie flat so that you don't have problems with pages moving while you're playing. Um, ask also about typical organ registrations or the sound choices that that organist uses. Um, I'm sure they'd be glad to share with you what they normally do for say hymn playing and solo playing and accompaniment. And they probably can tell you if they have preset res registrations that are usable by some preset buttons, which we'll talk about a little bit later in our presentation. And you may be able to just use what they already have set up on their organ. Um, be sure also to ask about location of any power switches. You'll probably be able to find it on the organ, but it's different on every organ. So be sure to ask about it and also Make sure to ask if there are any additional power switches. Some organs may have a switch both on the organ itself and somewhere on a wall that controls power in a more general way. So just be sure to ask about anything that you need to know. Ask about uh, whether or not there's a key to the organ if it's kept locked and where that is, how to get it, and if you need a key to access the space. And also, generally speaking, churches will be happy to accommodate you with some rehearsal time on the instrument itself, so make sure you book yourself some time on the instrument before the service if you can. So, with that being said, let's start with how to actually play. So the first thing you want to do is probably get yourself some organ shoes. I'm going to show you my shoes, and organ shoes are generally leather with kind of a soft suede leather sole. And they usually have a heel. You can see that this heel is about an inch or so. And they usually have a metal last, a uh, piece of metal inside. You can kind of see mine a little bit peeking through. It's time for me to get some new shoes. And that's gonna help support your foot. The other thing that this organ shoe is gonna allow you to do is it's gonna allow you to play pedals more easily when you get to the point of wanting to use the pedals. Don't panic. You can become functional as an organist without having to use your feet right away. Another good reason to have shoes is that you want to dedicate these shoes to nothing but organ playing. You do not want to wear them as street shoes. You don't want to track any debris or moisture into the organ because that's going to mess up the organ. And also, um, don't get your shoes wet and don't wear them around because it will destroy the sole. The smooth sole also is going to allow you to slide your foot more easily on the pedals, so it's going to make playing a little bit easier. And the heel on the, on the shoe is also going to help you with the ability to play the pedals with both your toes 
and your heels and make that transition a little bit smoother. Um, we are going to list on the resource document that we're going to link to uh, the website where you can buy organ shoes, organmastershoes.com. So, starting with the beginning, on this particular organ, the power switch happens to be underneath the organ. And so, we're going to turn that on and you're going to hear the wind pipes the wind chest. Typically, we have two types of organs. We have a pipe organ, which is what this is, and we have electronic organs. On a pipe organ, you have actual pipes, and typically there's a electric blower motor that generates air blowing across wind chests, and that air is allowed up into the pipes as you pull various stops that you want to use to produce the sounds. On an electronic organ, everything is electronic and computer generated based on sampling of different organ sounds. Either way, you're going to have a power switch. This one only has the one underneath the organ. There's no switches on the wall that need to be activated for that. Um, your organ bench, uh, a lot of times your organ bench may have some ability to adjust the height and you'll have to play around with that to find what works for you personally. We'll talk about that a little bit later too. Um, it may have a crank on the bench that raises it up and down. You may also have some wooden blocks that can be placed under the bench and sometimes those are custom made to fit under the bench so that they're very stable. So check around and that's one thing that you can ask the organist that you're substituting for about. Um, typically, at an organ, a lot of places will have a mirror that allows you to see behind you. If you're playing from a loft and you're not right up front, you may have an extra light source that you want to turn on. Uh, a lot of times there's a light attached to the music rack here. There's a switch on this side here. Um, usually those lights are not terribly strong, but they can be functional, so you may want to have an extra one. But oftentimes, if you're substituting for a, an organist who's already playing at the church, their setup is likely to already be in place and be very good. There's often a light on the pedal board as well. You might have to hunt around for that or ask the person that you're substituting for about it. And on this organ, we just keep the pedal light on and it comes on when you turn the power on to the organ. So you may have a setup much like that. All right, let's talk a little bit about the console itself. So as you can see, this particular organ has what we call three manuals. So three keyboards. Um, most organs are gonna have at least two, possibly three, maybe even four. Um, I have never played on, a man on an organ with more than four manuals. So, the names of the manuals, typically the middle one is your main one and perhaps your uh, one with the loudest sounds attached to it. So this one is called the grate. This one up here on top is called the swell. And this one down here on this organ, we call it the positif. Sometimes it's called the choir. And as you can see, if I'm pressing the keys, there's no sound right now. The way you get a sound is to tell this organ you want to turn on some pipes and let the air flow through a particular pipe and make a sound. You can see a lot of knobs here. These are called draw knobs. And on some organs, you're going to have draw knobs. On other organs, you may have tabs that look more like what you see up here. And you, you may have them on the sides. They may be running across up here. You'll have to look at your particular organ. The way that the knobs are arranged on this particular organ, the first, the leftmost set of draw knobs relates to the pedal board, which is underneath you. The next set relates to the swell keyboard. The next set relates to the grate. This set over here relates to the positif. And this little set over here 
relates to some, a smaller set of pipes that is actually in the front of the church. And it can be played either here from this console or from a very small console up in front. You may not have an arrangement like that. You may, you'll have to look at your own organ. And if you have an electronic organ or a hybrid organ, you may also have some MIDI options attached to it. Um, for electronic organs, two of the main brands these days are Rogers and Allen. And oftentimes, um, if you have an Allen organ, the MIDI option may be hiding in a little drawer that's over here to the side of the console. And it'll give you some options and there'll be some um, the buttons that allow you to tell e which manual you want to play the MIDI. So I encourage you to just spend some time getting to know your organ, play around, experiment, and also if you are playing on an electronic organ, there may be a manual hiding in an organ bench that tells you all about it. You may also be able to find some of that information online from the manufacturer. And I'm sure your resident organist will be happy to help you also. You'll see that each one of these draw knobs has a name of a stop on it that is descriptive of the type of sound that you can expect. And generally speaking on an organ, you're going to have some flute sounds which sound kind of like a flute, but a little bit different from an orchestra flute. Um, kind of a wind type sound and a lighter sound. You'll have some what we call principal sounds that sound like a typical organ sound and then you'll have some reed sounds that sound a little bit more like baby brass or some of the reed woodwinds like an oboe, that sort of a thing. You're going to use different sounds for different purposes. Alex is going to demonstrate this a little bit later in one of his presentations too. You'll also notice that there are numbers on each one of these draw knobs and that tells you how the sound relates to what you're playing on the keyboard. Generally on a pipe organ, the number eight that you see is going to represent a sound that is going to sound where you expect it to on a piano keyboard. So for instance, if you're looking at these manuals, they are generally five octaves or about 61 keys, if I count it correctly, and middle C is about where you would expect it. So if you pull a stop or a draw knob that has an eight attached to it, I'm going to pull the eight foot principle here, you're going to get a typical organ sound. And then when you play the key that looks like middle C, you're going to get a sound right where you would expect it to be. If you pull one that has a four attached to it, it's going to sound an octave above. A two is going to sound two octaves above where you're playing it on the keyboard and a one is three octaves above. A 16 is gonna sound an octave below. And a 32, which you won't generally see on the manuals, but you'd see in the pedal, would sound two octaves below. And when we look at the pedal keyboard in a little bit, you'll see that middle C is actually off to your right. So what is gonna be pretty much right beneath you if you're sitting in the center of your bench is going to be the note that is typically the C below middle C. I would encourage you to spend some time on the instrument that you're gonna be playing and just pull out different stops, see what they sound like, see what you like, try some together. Generally, when you build a registration, you wanna start with eight foot stops, that's kind of your foundation. And then when you wanna add a little bit more from there, you would maybe add some four foot stops on top of that, maybe some two foot stops. Those are probably going to be most of what you would need if you're just starting out to play. There are stops here with fractional numbers and Roman numerals on them. Those are mixtures or variants. They combine some of the overtone series of the sounds and they're going to create a different colorful effect. So as you pull different sounds to play, when you're done playing, typically you're going to want to cancel your registration. And rather than having to push back in every draw knob that you have pulled individually, 
you'll want to hit the general cancel button. So usually the general cancel button is located over here somewhere on the bottom right of your keyboard and it's generally labeled something that's intuitively obvious. So if you press that, all the stops will go in. Um, you'll notice that in addition to the actual pedals underneath the organ, the actual note pedals, that there are probably at least one, maybe multiple other pedals underneath your organ. And on this organ, we have what's called one expression pedal for what's the swell division. And this is attached to the swell keyboard that is up on top. And what it does is if you're playing the uh, swell keyboard, it literally, on a pipe organ, often physically closes some wooden shutters that house um, the pipes that make the sound on this keyboard. And then as you push the pedal forward, much like you're pushing down a gas pedal in a car, it's going to open those shutters and make the sound louder. And what this does is it allows you to have some color variation or some control over your volume as you're playing so that you can do some shading. You'll have to look on your organ to see how many expression pedals you have. You may only have one for a swell box on a pipe organ. You may have multiples on an electronic organ. You may have one for each manual, which can be very convenient. You'll also see um, You will also see an additional pedal um, that is called a crescendo pedal. And what this does is it brings online the sound of the organ and it adds, as you press the pedal forward as if you're pressing down a gas pedal, it adds stops in succession in a way to smoothly build an increasingly full organ sound. So for example, I'm going to press down, I have no stops pulled, no draw knobs pulled, and I'm holding down a basic chord, and I'm going to turn the crescendo pedal on slowly. So you'll hear some of the more basic softer sounds come online first, and then you'll hear even more, and it can get pretty loud. And so if you get all the way to the end of where the crescendo pedal goes, you'll get a really full organ sound. And that can be useful if you are perhaps in the middle of playing a hymn and you just need to give a little bit more sound, perhaps on a final verse where you're trying to be really festive, or even if you're sometimes accompanying a piece and you have a quick dynamic change, um, you'll have to kind of judge whether that is appropriate or whether an actual change in your registration choices is more appropriate, depending on what is needed for that particular piece. So, if you need to change your registration in the middle of a piece, how do you do it quickly? Or if you need to change, say, from a prelude to a beginning hymn rather quickly, it can be pretty time consuming to individually pull knobs. You'll see here on this keyboard that there are buttons kind of below each manual. And what these are are preset buttons. They're basically combination pistons that allow you to tell the organ, all right, on this preset, I want to attach these stops. On this preset, I want to attach these stops. And then with a touch of one button, you can have all those stops pulled for you at once. You'll see on this particular organ, and you'll have to look on the organ that you're playing to see how it's set up. Um, if you have an older organ, you might, it's possible that you might not have any presets, but you're likely to have at least some. On these, there are five presets for each manual that are dedicated to that manual alone, so those will only work with stops associated with that particular manual. And then over here, you have seven general pistons, which are going to work with the whole organ. So anything that you pull on any manual is going to be saved to that. The way that you set these, so for example, I just pressed general number one. 
to set these, you would pull out the stops that you want. So I've pulled a couple choices on the pedal. I've pulled a choice, couple choices on the swell. I've pulled a choice on the grate. I've pulled a choice on the positif. And I've actually also used a coupler, which we haven't talked about. These buttons here are a way to add from one keyboard to another. And typically you can add from any keyboard to the great keyboard. You pull out, you set what you want, you press in, there's typically a general set button and it's usually somewhere over to the left on the bottom of your console here. You push that in, you press the button you want to set it to, you let go of that button, you let go of the set button, and the next time you press that button, there are your choices. And it's a good idea to double check after you set um, your registrations. Um, it's easy to not be thorough about pressing in and to think that you have pressed something and then turn, it turns out that you might not have it. So definitely I encourage you to double check your presets. Also some organs, um, this one has some what we call memory banks. So different levels of menu uh, presets. And on this, you have seven general pistons, um, but there are also multiple memory levels where, so you can save seven general settings. Um, on this one, there's like 32 levels. So you can save seven times 32 general settings. And you can see over here, the different memory levels. Um, that can be very handy for if you want to have your, a library of registrations, if for example you're playing at a church regularly and you want to save some registrations that you'd like for hymn playing, for solo accompaniment, for choir accompaniment, that sort of thing. And it can also be very handy if you are substituting for an organist, ask them whether or not you can use their presets. They probably do not want you to change their presets, but you may be able to use what they already have and they may also have a memory bank level that they are willing to let you use that they don't mind being changed. So ask about that when you talk to the person that you're going to be playing for. Okay, I think now we should probably take a look at the pedal board and some of the things that are underneath here. So we talked about the fact that there are seven general preset pistons that cover the whole organ. And on each manual, you have five that pertain just to that keyboard alone. You have kind of a similar setup down here. You can see these toe pistons here, and these are labeled general on this organ, one through seven, and they are basically duplicates of the finger buttons that are up top. So if you're busy with both hands, and you want to change quickly to another set of registrations, you can just hit the corresponding toe piston and you can hear these changing as I go along. Um, just be careful where you're at and uh, know what you're hitting. There are, you might find some interesting um, things on a particular organ. This one has, for instance, a Zimbelstern, which is right here next to the swell expression pedal, and I have been known to accidentally hit it and start a very nice sound, but perhaps not when you want it. Um, over here on this organ, here are some other, uh, here's five presets for the pedal division itself. So this is, kind of mirrors the whole setup that you have five for each individual keyboard. These are the five individuals for the pedals themselves. So if you have certain pedal combinations that you like and you want to be able to toggle back and forth in a piece where maybe part of the piece is soft and you want to play it on a swell keyboard with one registration, part of it's loud, and you want to play in a grate with another and you need to change your pedals accordingly. You'll also see a few of the couplers also down here mirroring what the buttons up here that allowing you to take, say, the swell keyboard to the grate or whatever. Um, these are allowing you to take 
say, for instance, grate to pedal. So anything that you have pulled on the grate keyboard, say an eight foot principle, if you want to duplicate that on the pedals, if you want that sound to also be playable from the pedals, you can do grate to pedal and it basically couples that sound. Now we mentioned earlier on the pedal board, typically um, an AGO standard pedal board has um, two and a half octaves and is curved and the pedals are spaced the same way on every pedal board that's going to be the AGO standard. So you can have some consistency. You're going to want to be aware if you're playing maybe an older instrument or a historic instrument or a different type of instrument like a tracker instrument. It may have a different type of pedal board so definitely check it out before you play. But here, this is an AGO pedal board. Here's middle C, it goes up to a G above middle C, and the eight foot stop is sounding exactly where you would expect it to. So this is here, the C below middle C. You typically play your pedals with, you can play with both toe and heel. Toe is maybe a little bit more secure, but heel also allows you to kind of go up a scale or change to a different note. You can also transfer your weight if you start out on a toe. You may want to slide a little bit, switch to the heel, and that frees you up to go down to the next note or up, for instance, whatever direction you're going, or to an accidental with your toe. And there is a lot more. One of the resources we have listed in the resource document is a series of 30 videos that are free to anyone on the agohq.org website. That's the website of the National American Guild of Organists Association. And they have done a very nice series of 30 videos which go into a lot more detail than we're doing in this workshop about how to learn to play the organ. And you're free to peruse that and they go into much more detail about paddling technique, playing technique, registrations, how to build one, all of those considerations. So I would definitely encourage you to look at that. Um, there are also a couple other things on here that we might want to cover. You'll see another button down here called Swartz Sondo. That's a toe piston that mirrors a button up here that's labeled SFZ for Fort Sondo. And that is basically almost like a crescendo pedal with a touch of a button you get a really big organ sound. You're probably not going to want to use that in a typical service but if you ever need it that's what it's there for. You might find some buttons labeled 2D, you might have a couple of them 2D1, 2D2 and they're basically very full organ sounds that are kind of pre-put together, similar to the way that a crescendo has a full organ sound attached to it when you press the pedal all the way in. So we've pretty much covered everything that you're going to see on the console. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some playing considerations before we flip over to Alex, who's going to do some demonstrations of some of the things we've been talking about. Um, you want to position yourself on the bench, kind of in the center of the bench, and you want to kind of test out. You want to be sitting right on your sits bones. You want to kind of be over maybe a D or an E or the C on the pedal board that's below middle C right there. You kind of want your feet to be able to touch the pedals, but you don't want to be having to put weight on them if your feet are dangling. Um, typically on the organ bench, there's a piece of wood that spans the whole bench underneath that you can hook your heel onto to rest your feet. If you're not using your feet for an extended period of time, that can be very helpful. Um, you want to test out your relationship to each of the manuals. It's going to be different. So there's not going to be one same position for every manual. You want to kind of be in the center of the bench, maybe a little bit forward so that you can kind of go forward and back a little bit if you need to, to kind of adjust your relationship to the keys as you play. Um, generally speaking, you want to be able to 
pivot a little bit on the bench to play different pedal notes. And again, you're not gonna, if you're just starting out, don't worry too much about this. It's, there's plenty of music out there for manuals and it's perfectly possible to play a very nice service without even using your beat. So yes, if you wanna learn, there's a ton to learn on the organ and you can very easily be a lifelong learner on the organ, but you do not need to be intimidated to get started. So no worries. Um, some fingering considerations. Let's talk about it a little bit. On the piano, in order to make a legato sound, you have the benefit of using a damper pedal to sustain some of the notes that you've already hit. You don't have that on the organ. You also don't have um, the same kind of touch sensitivity. No matter how hard or how quickly you hit the keys on the organ, it's not gonna change the volume. What changes the volume is the different stops that you pull and maybe an expression pedal if you have one attached to that particular manual. So if you want a legato sound on the organ, you're gonna to have to do it with your fingers. If you are playing, say, a chord, and you want to play other chords, if you're gonna move in legato fashion, you're gonna to have to do some finger substitutions in order to allow you to move. So for instance, if you can see my fingers here, watch me change my fingers. So you hold down notes and move your fingers so that you can get a finger free in order to move to other notes. And that is something that will come over time as you practice doing it. You're going to probably need to be able to do that in him playing, especially if you're playing all the parts on the manual only without using your feet. Um, you're also going to want to be able to perhaps take some notes with your left hand that you might normally hand might have to kind of pick up some notes in the tenor line if you're playing a four-part hymn setting. Um, prior to about box time, the fingering in the practice and playing the organ was not necessarily a fully legato sound. It was what might be called ordinary touch or a slightly detached sound. Not necessarily a true staccato, but maybe something that has just a little bit of separation between the notes. And something that went along with that was different fingerings were in use at that time too. And I am far from an expert on this, but rather than turning the thumb under and doing a full legato, you might have practices out there that actually moved the whole hand and just repositioned the fingers. And one of the nice things about that is that it allows you to play some things very quickly that would be very difficult to play if you were trying to play a truly legato line. Um, a couple of the resources that are listed on the document that goes with this video, particularly the organ method resources from Oxford University Press go into this in much more detail. And you can also find more information about it in that series of videos on the AGO website. And it can allow you to really play some very sparkling repertoire without um, hurting your hands or having to work as hard as you might think you have to. So those are some general things to keep in mind. Um, and with that, let's cut over to Alex Messler, who is going to demonstrate a few of the things we've been talking about. He's going to talk a little bit about registration He's going to demonstrate some hymn playing and he's going to play a couple of pieces for you, both legato and non-legato that are very easy and sound very beautiful. So they are great pieces both for beginning players and also for experienced players when you need something in a pinch. One of the more stressful things that uh, uh, pianists encounter when they, when they are first uh, dealing with the organ is the stops. Um, yes, it looks very stressful, but in reality, it's not that complicated. It gets very complicated when you are trying to perfect uh, extremely hard repertoire and things like that, but uh, you don't need to go there right away, so start somewhere simple. Basically, an eight-foot stop sounds at the same pitch that a piano sounds at. So if I play middle C and I select from this keyboard an eight-foot stop, 
it will sound middle C. Now if I get rid of that eight foot stop and pull a four foot stop, it will actually sound an octave up. All the feet mean, theoretically at least, is that the pipe, the lowest C that I'm playing down here, is eight feet long. Eight foot principle, this pipe theoretically is eight feet long. The four foot on that low C is four feet long. The two foot, another octave up, is two feet long. If I had a one foot, it would be another octave up. Now we also have different names of stuff. So this organ has three eight foots on the main manual, an eight foot principal, an eight foot gedeckt, and an eight foot violon. Now all three of those sound at the same pitch. So I'm gonna play this low C again. Here's the eight foot, well I'll play middle C actually, it'll sound a little better. Here's middle C on the eight foot principal. It sounds very much like an organ. Now I'm gonna pull the gedeckt, which is a flute stop. It sounds hollower. And the violone sounds very harmonically active. Now I can combine those in any number of ways. Now if that just stresses you out, just choose a couple together. The principles, if you're accompanying a hymn, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, playing a hymn, then uh, the principle's a great place to start. Um, usually the principle's voiced uh, to the room, meaning it, it sounds uh, good in a particular room. Uh, okay, so those are the main uh, types of things. Uh, uh, and then we also have read stops which if you're just playing a service and you're just trying to play hymns, uh, you can completely avoid them if you want to. If you want to include them in your hymn playing, uh, it can be a great way to add a lot of color, but sometimes they're too loud, depending on the size of the congregation. So this organ has a lot of different reeds. Um, the eight foot bombard on the grate, for instance, is absolutely huge. I still have many other reeds. Now that, pipe actually functions differently. There's a little reed inside that's banging against what's called a shallot. It's usually made of um, some kind of brass. Um, uh, so those tend to be much louder, uh, much more active kinds of stops. You can use them really nicely as a solo. So this organ on the upper manual has an oboe, which sounds a little bit like an oboe. Um, so you can experiment with those things. The other thing I want to mention, uh, just very briefly, is couplers. Um, uh, so you can have, um, basically what couplers do is they take uh, sounds from one manual and transfer them to another manual. So in this particular case, and on most American organs, the middle keyboard, if there are three, uh, is the main keyboard. Usually, not always, usually. Um, now I can take different stops and move them here. So right now, if I play middle C on this keyboard, nothing happens because there are no stops, there are no couplers on. Now I'm gonna pull um, an eight foot stop on the positive division, this lower division. So I can play it here, but when I play middle C on the main keyboard, nothing happens. But if I go up here and select, this is called the positive, positive to great, okay, positive to great, eight foot, I'm now playing the two stops, I'm sorry, the eight foot stop from the positif on the great division. This is a great way to get uh, more sound out of the organ. Say I want to pull all the eight foots on the organ, so I pull the eight foots here, I pull the eight foots here, and I pull the eight foots here, and then I tap the, uh, the positif to great and the swell to great. I've got this really lovely round eight foot sound. There are two main different scenarios for choosing stops. One is preludes, postludes, that sort of thing, where I'm playing solo, and it doesn't so much matter what I pick as long as it's interesting and it balances well. Uh, so for that, I would just encourage you to experiment and find sounds that you like. Um, you know, contact uh, an organist friend if you have one, or contact uh, you know somebody in the American Guild of Organists if you're just looking for some advice. Um, but on that front, uh, really the sky's the limit. Now on hymn playing, it's a little bit more restricted um, when you're starting out. Wh when you are an advanced hymn player, and you're, you're out there, the, you, again, the sky's the limit there. There's a whole art to hymn playing and it's a lot of fun. Um, but uh, when you're just starting out, you really just wanna find something that will support the singing, right? 
So um, what I would encourage first is if, if you're substituting for an organist, ask them. Ask them, what stops do you use to typically accompany um, a hymn? They're, it's not embarrassing to ask. In fact, it's really helpful because it can really stop um, some really uh, surprising things from happening during the service. So if they have a small congregation, uh, you're going to use a smaller sound. Um, remember also, as you're selecting stops, you are the leader for the hymn playing. It's not like accompanying a soloist. You're actually um, the person leading the singing. So phrasing, all of those things. Um, so your registration, you want it to be full and, and strong and, and, and supportive, but not overpowering. But you, on the other side, you don't want it to be underwhelming. So it really depends on the size of the room and the size of the congregation. So these are questions, ask the organist, um, uh, or if there isn't an organist, ask um, somebody in the room, play for them and ask, hey, does this seem uh, to be the appropriate volume? Um, so a great place to start is just with a, a, a smaller principal chorus, like eight foot and four foot um, principles, um, and you can get kind of a, a full sound that way. <laughs> That's not very much sound, so if you have a congregation that really likes to sing, you're probably going to need to pull some other stuff. So I might actually couple in similar stuff from the 12th, and then uh, even that makes a little bit of a difference. It's not that strong still, but maybe if I add the oboe, it just adds a little buzz, it adds a little color, um, and then I just take the edge off by closing the 12 box. congregation that tends to work. Now again some congregations sing a lot more than the one where I work so I might add the two foot stop which adds quite a bit of upper register um, and it might sound like this. All this is to say do some research. How much does the congregation sing? How big is the room? How loud is the organ? Ask for help. Probably the most frequent thing you'll be asked to do as a substitute organist learning to play is to play hymns. Now, typically we take the bass part with our feet, but it's possible uh, to still play a hymn and not have to um, completely uh, use your feet. Um, however, it can sound uh, not so great um, if you don't do a few things. Let me demonstrate. If I just play this as if it were a piano, You'll see that it's, it's not horrible, uh, but it lacks some of the uh, qualities that we desire in our organ music. Sure, it's not terrible. But if I just make a slight effort, still not using my feet, to make sure that especially the soprano and bass lines are legato, I can make a very big difference in the way that this hymn sounds. So it makes a big difference. Now, I still breathe at the end of the phrase, so it's important, I think, to sing these things uh, when you're trying to learn, uh, because ultimately what we're doing is uh, leading uh, the singing. So I need to make sure that I breathe so that people know that they can breathe. So at the end of the line. <laughs> Just by making the soprano and bass voices legato, I've done a lot to make the organ sound like an organ. I want to play for you a short piece entitled Aria by Hugh Morgan, a living Welsh composer. Uh, this piece was composed in 2017, um, and it's a really lovely piece for uh, beginners, um, but I play it all the time. Um, sometimes simple is better. 
Uh, so basically, it, there's three different texture, three different voices creating one texture. Uh, you've got the left hand, which has this uh, sort of repeating uh, motive pattern thing, uh, where it happens on the offbeat. So you can see here, one and and three and four and etc. And it continues like that throughout the piece, occasionally changing the notes, adding a note here and there. Uh, that is played on one manual, so one keyboard, uh, with one type of sound. Usually I choose to do um, some sort of string there. So this particular organ has a stop called the viol de gamba, um, but you know anything could work if you had a, a flute or something, it would be just fine. Um, on the other manual, so my right hand, is where the melody is gonna come in. And here I uh, uh, chose to use uh, just a flute, this really clear uh, flute on this organ, it's called the gedacht. Um, and then finally, in my feet, yes, this piece has feet, but you can do it. Um, all it is is whole notes tied to whole notes tied to whole notes, and there are only three different notes total. Um, and you just hold it when it comes to it, and it creates this really lovely texture. Um, uh, I would say the one challenge with this is figuring out a way when the right hand is doing two, ver uh, two voices, which only happens once, um, to make sure that that upper voice especially stays legato. Um, so only break when there are phrase breaks. So uh, he actually has a repeat in this piece. Um, I am, just for the sake of time, but also for the sake of not worrying about uh, a registration change, so changing the stops, um, I'm just not going to play it. But um, I would recommend you play it even if you don't change the stops like he asks. Um, so here is Aria by Hugh Morgan. Thank you. So that's a very lovely little piece. Um, again, only three different pedal notes, uh, which should make it totally um, uh, 
doable for any pianist just starting out. All you need to do is plop your foot down where it goes uh, three different times. Yeah. Sandy has spent some time talking about the differences between uh, legato playing and non-legato playing, or sometimes it's called ordinary touch. Uh, now, legato playing tends to be the technique uh, that, uh, I wouldn't say scare, but it, it um, can be a struggle for pianists um, uh, because we do these uh, really bizarre things with substitution that really um, any piano teacher would scoff at, um, and rightly so, but here we need those techniques. Um, that's not to say that non-legato technique is exactly the same as how we approach the piano. Um, there are differences in how we space things because of we can't accent on the organ. Um, we can only accent with time, so more space. So when I play four beats, that beat one feels more like beat one, not because it's louder, but because there was more space before it. Listen again. too is I could hold uh, that beat longer. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, right? Um, now that affects everything um, in our playing. But I wanted to play for you now just a really short, uh, short little piece by uh, Domenico Zippoli, uh, a Baroque era composer. Um, just to show you, this is a piece you could easily download on IMSLP for free or um, you know, any, any sort of thing. A great way to select music if you need to play a prelude is just type in <laughs> organ composers and, and find the easiest stuff that you can uh, uh, and, and try to experiment until you find a piece that you think uh, your playing uh, sounds good with. Um, in this particular case, there's a bunch of 16th notes, but they're kind of in uh, easy to deal with patterns. Um, so any pianist could sight read this on the piano. Um, and if you just experiment a little bit with articulation, I think you'll get to something uh, kind of satisfying. So for this piece, just to show you uh, something kind of unique, I'll play it on a four foot flute alone. So an octave up from where you're used to hearing piano music. Um, and it can create this really lovely um, effect. <laughs>
lovely little piece, and without much effort, right, you can um, learn a piece, whether it's this piece or some other similar piece. Um, uh, composers like Scarlatti, the sonatas work really well. Um, you just have to gauge uh, what kind of piece uh, will work uh, well on the organ. Um, also keep in mind that that piece has no use of the pedals whatsoever and sounds very much like organ. All right, so thank you, Alex, so much for your presentations. Let's wrap up with a very brief discussion of resources. There is a document link below this video that lists some resources. Um, we have some history and method books, and as I mentioned, the first two in that list from Oxford University Press are excellent resources that talk about technique, and they also have embedded into them various pieces and learning exercises that you can use as you go. So if you want to kind of teach yourself and practice progressively, they, those are excellent resources for you to do. And there's a couple other historical references in there, resources on there too, that you can use as background. Um, we've listed some online resources. Again, agohq.org is the American Guild of Organists um, website. They have information there too about membership and about the conventions that they have every year. They have national conventions, they have regional conventions. Um, all of those are excellent resources and ways to learn. The AGO also has a series of certification exams. So the easiest one is probably the service playing exam, which basically tests your skills on that you would need to play a service, a lot of what we've talked about today. And then there are other exams for different levels as well. And those are all basically, um, you can self-study for those exams and schedule them. There's information on the website and those are wonderful tools and the preparation materials that are available on the website also are wonderful tools to help build your skills. Um, we've listed the website for where you can purchase shoes. We've listed uh, other, a, a few other websites where you can find repertoire and we've also I've also listed some um, easy print repertoire that I have in my personal collection. Some of it I've had for a while. There's plenty of it out there. There's always new repertoire coming out. And you can just Google um, organ music for manuals, easy organ music, that sort of a thing. Um, so there is plenty of resources out there. I would encourage you to join your local chapter of the American Guild of Organists. We're a friendly bunch and we're definitely in need of more organists in the world. Do not be intimidated. There's plenty to learn on the organ. You can be a lifelong learner, but don't hesitate to start. So with that, thank you for joining us today and happy organ playing. <laughs>